At the age of 24, Elizabeth Blackwell had selected medicine as a means of proving a truth she believed to be divinely sanctioned, that women could be anything they wished according to the limits of individual talent and toil, and in reaching their fullest potential would raise humanity closer to that ideal. She believed God had chosen her to pursue this arduous path, and she had chosen Emily, her most capable sister, to follow her. And Elizabeth did become the first woman to receive a medical degree in the United States. And in 1849, she later enlisted her younger sister, Emily, to join her. Together, they ran the New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and Children, and founded a woman's medical college. Even though, as Namora puts it, opening a separate school for women was just about the last thing that they had planned to do. How they both achieved that, that journey, their journey, and all of those people that thwarted them and encouraged them is told in Janice's new book, The Doctors Blackwell, how two pioneering sisters brought medicine to women and women to medicine. There's a reason this book has been called enthralling, riveting, and vividly realized, because indeed it has it all. I am delighted to welcome Janice today. She has received many awards for her work, and in particular, the Public Scholar Award from the National Endowment for the Humanities in support of her uh, work on the Doctors Blackwell. Janice, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I can't think of a better place to be tonight. Well, that's, yeah, well, it is nice. I, it was too, when Erica mentioned that it is the last day of Women's History Month, and um, these were a couple of pretty extraordinary uh, women. So here's the, here's the topics I hope we get to today. Uh, one is we want to talk about their path to becoming uh, doctors, no small feat. Uh, this unusual Blackwell family, um, this large Blackwell family. The other thing I learned so much about that I want us to get to is the state of medicine and hospitals in, in those days. And then we're going to get to their quirky, maybe not always appealing <laughs> personalities, um, you know, they are heroes in many ways and challenging in others. So, and you do a great job of telling that story. So speaking of journeys, let's start with uh, August of 1832 and the Blackwell family leaves Bristol, England. So tell us a little bit about who, who is this family and why with all their kids, are they heading to America on this like pretty ugly seven week trip? That's right. So uh, the patriarch of the Blackwell family, Samuel, um, was sort of a paradox. He had made his money in the sugar industry. Bristol was a sugar capital and he was a sugar refiner. Um, and in his free time, he was an ardent abolitionist, which when you think about it for more than a second is- A little funny juxtaposition. <laughs> right. So. so um, he was, you know, he he was an iconoclast and an, and an unorthodox thinker. He was somebody who wanted to kind of align his industry with his sense of morality. And he had this dream of figuring out a way to um, sort of correct the moral hygiene of the sugar industry by making it from sugar beets in the north rather than with um, Caribbean cane, which exploited enslaved people. Mm. Um, uh, he wanted to find a way to, 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 to change his industry. So he moved his family. At the time, his wife and eight children, as well as I think two sisters and a bunch of servants, um, on this voyage to America to find a way to do this. And also, I think, to engage more actively with the abolitionist cause, um, which in England at this point was a little bit abstract. Um, but in America, in 1832, they really needed people like him. Um, so they got on this ship in the Cosmo in Bristol, and they spent weeks and weeks in the hold of this ship while cholera um, raged and, uh, and, and it actually arrived in New York in the middle 
of another epidemic. So, you know, disease is, is part of the story from the very start. Yeah, and, and the thing that was interesting to me, so there were nine kids, five girls, none of them married. That's right. Um, well, so the family moves to New York, they spend a few years in New York, and then the father, still pursuing this dream of growing sugar beets, um, moves the family all the way out to the edge of the known universe, which in that, in 1838 at this point, is Cincinnati, um, which is a, a, a little town basically based around the pork industry. Um, and they get out there in August of 1838, and Samuel Blackwell dies, leaving his wife and now nine children with almost nothing. Um, so it was a very clear lesson that as much as you love your husband or father, um, he is no guarantee of security. Um, and his five daughters, I think, took that lesson to heart. They had to leap into action to go to work to rescue the family from financial peril. And they never really um, thought of settling down as, as a secure thing after that, um, I think with good reason. And, and, and would you guess that because they were a tight clan, they were intellectual, current issues were very much a part of their lives. And do you, do you, did you, do you have an opinion about whether they ended up all, all the women ended up being so independent because of their father's death or the sort of construct of their family life? Right. There was an interesting inversion sort of that took place because in the moment of being orphaned, um, uh, losing their father, the oldest Blackwell children, the three oldest were women. Were women. Uh, they were the ones who were of age and they leaped into action as teachers to rescue the family. Um, I think both proving to themselves that they could be wage earners and also um, as their brothers who were younger came of age and moved into the workforce, those young men were unusually willing to support their sisters, yeah. I think really out of gratitude for having um, rescued the family. And they, they went a long way towards supporting their, their sisters' professional careers, um, you know, helping to finance Elizabeth and Emily's medical, medical careers and also their, sis, their eldest sister, Anna, who was a journalist and their youngest sister, Ellen, who was a painter. I think there was an unusual degree of willingness to support female ventures because female industriousness had rescued them. Yeah, so Elizabeth uh, has a, I'm going to call it a detour. She probably wouldn't call it a detour, but a detour as a teacher. And actually uh, in slave owning states. So she was confronted with that. But we fast forward to what um, she, her deciding to go to medical school. So let, let's start with this. What was medical school in those days? I mean, we think of it now as this, you know, 12 or 18 year path to becoming a doctor, an extremely exclusive uh, process of diligent education. But what was it then? Not that. <laughs> um, then in the mid 1840s, when Elizabeth first hit upon this intention of going there, um, medical school was um, two consecutive and identical 16 week terms of lectures. Yeah. You you, you got there, you sat through 16 weeks of lectures, you went off for the summer to get some practical training if you could, and then you came back and you sat through the identical set of yeah. lectures again. And With then you tickets, took the right? You had tickets or something to... Well, so, right. So the way you paid your tuition, I mean, a medical school was sort of a loose conglomeration of medical professors and the students would buy a semester long ticket to each, each professor's subject. So you would have a little deck of cards in your writing desk, one for chemistry, one for pathology, one for, you know, women's diseases, one for, you know, materia medica, the pharmacology. Um, that's how you did it. Um, you basically sat with a notebook and pen. You, if you were lucky, got to do a little bit of dissection. Mostly you just watched and you graduated with a diploma and an alarming degree of ignorance. Yeah. Um, really maybe had never touched a living patient. Right. Uh, unless you got lucky with your mentors. 
So Elizabeth makes this decision with the lofty goal uh, of really changing the world. I mean, and I don't think I'm overstating the case. That's right. And she wasn't very interested in healing individuals. Her, Her goal was to sort of raise humanity by proving what women could do. So now she decides to apply to medical school. There are no women doctors in the United States and therefore no women in medical schools. What did that all look like? Well, the very idea of a woman who wanted to go to medical school was impossible in the in the imagination. I mean, there were plenty of women healers. There were there were midwives. There were um, uncredentialed women who were good with herbal remedies or who sold patent remedies. There were lots of women who were involved in healing. But the idea of a woman who wanted to go to a men's medical school and sit in a room studying the processes of the body among men was outrageous. It was scandalous. Yeah. What kind of a woman who, who called herself a woman would, would want that? And it was, it was disgusting. You know, she, she was treated a lot sort of like a circus freak. So who would want to do that? Yeah. And so the school she gets into, uh, Geneva College, she actually got in as a joke. A bit. So she re- receives a sheaf of rejections from all of the mainstream medical schools. Um, and then, you know, sort of as she, she, starts to cast her net more widely and kind of uh, um, humble her, her, her ambitions as far as prestige goes. And she sends off a, a letter to Geneva College, which is uh, at the tip of Seneca Lake in Western New York State, um, a, a little provincial place with, with a, you know, a fairly backwater bunch of students. Um, and she has a, a letter of recommendation from a, from a professor, uh, from a physician that she is studying with in Philadelphia. And this arrives at Geneva College and the faculty there aren't quite brave enough or bold enough to just say no out of hand. This is a a rather socially prominent physician who has endorsed Elizabeth. They're not quite brave enough to do that. So they punt and they give the question to the students, a boisterous bunch. They would say, you know, you went into medicine if you weren't smart enough to go into the law. So this was a, this was a pretty rowdy group. And they, they said to the students, okay, students, if any one of you objects to this woman studying among us, we won't do it, but you vote. And the students quickly realized two things. One, that there uh, was a, that the, their professors were cowards. They weren't bold enough to say no. And two, that they had an opportunity to make some real mischief. So they had a, a, a student meeting that night where they sort of bludgeoned into submission anybody who had any qualms about a woman coming and triumphantly returned a unanimous yes the next morning and then forgot about it. They thought, it was probably a prank that a rival medical school had cooked up to fool them. And it left their minds until three weeks later when a young woman walked into the lecture hall. You know, the thing that was striking to me in all of uh, Elizabeth, you know, starting with, at Geneva and even starting with the doctor um, in Philadelphia who was, uh, she was very effective at developing mentors and winning people over, and not by her cheery personality, but by her industriousness, her, you know, I guess she, her intelligence was pretty uh, extraordinary. Tell us a little bit about what that was like, really from the get-go with Geneva, even, even against the odds. Sure. I mean, I think Elizabeth had a lot in common with, I think, I, I, see, I see this as sort of a pattern among women who are really ahead of the curve in what they're trying to do. The earliest feminists often have this edit- attitude that the way to go about what they want to achieve is to be undeniably excellent. And if you are yeah. undeniably excellent, the world will, will kind of bend toward you because there is no denying that you are equipped, that you are qualified, that you are talented that you were glorious. Um, Elizabeth really objected to radicalism, to being noisy, and to, to activism that, that, um, that ruffled feathers. She really believed that if she was just um, as good as it could be, that the world would recognize her and, and acknowledge that she was right. Um, she had a very strong sense of her own rightness, righteousness. And, and capacity. Right. She was undeniably brilliant. This, I mean, one thing that her, you know, unorthodox father had given the women in the family was the same education that, that the sons had received. She was an extraordinarily well-read young woman. Mm. It's, but we, you know, we talk about 
her belief in excellence. You, you say in the book that Elizabeth regarded women with the calm superiority of a benevolent deity. Unattributed, her words could pass as the musings of a profoundly paternalistic man. Women were not her peers or her equals, and she had little desire to work alongside them. Well, right. I mean, she had no tolerance for fools. She, she was not interested in spending her time with people she thought were, were dumb or stupid or weak or um, dithering or ninnies. Um, she really believed, I mean, to me, what, what motivated her, what was a catalyst for her quest was this, this idea from Margaret Fuller um, who wrote about um, how humanity was not going to rise to a new plane of enlightenment until women proved what they could do. Mm. Um, and Elizabeth saw her life as something that could prove Margaret Fuller's point. She was not really interested in, in helping individual women. She was interested in helping humanity. Mm. And she wanted to be a beacon to women who, to this point, she really thought had let themselves down. She really didn't see women as being enthralled to men. She saw women as enslaving themselves, as not wanting more, as not claiming what was theirs. And so she set out to do that while having a, I mean, while, while maintaining a fairly dim opinion of other women. It was rare for her to come across a woman who really knocked her socks off. Well, speaking of women that did knock her socks off, uh, she, after she finishes uh, medical school, so to speak, <laughs> and she goes to Europe and there, develops this network, which I'll come back and ask about, because it's like crazy to me that you're like meeting this person and they take you in and they do this and introduce you and take you to other parts of Europe. But two of the women she does um, become friendly with are one Florence Nightingale and the other is Lady Byron, two quite different women. Now you would have thought that for Florence Nightingale and Elizabeth Blackwell would have been very aligned in their view of women in medicine. Uh, but in fact, they weren't that aligned. They, they were and they weren't. So, you know, Florence Nightingale and Elizabeth Blackwell are introduced in, in about 1850 by mutual friends in London when Elizabeth is studying there. And they're they're, they're and the Florence Nightingale is not really Florence Nightingale, capital F, capital N yet, right? <laughs> Right. So the, the Crimean War is years away. The whole lady with the lamp global yeah, right. is not happening yet. Not happening yet. Right. Florence Nightingale is a young woman who is a year older than Elizabeth, I think, um, whose family desperately wants her to settle down and get married. It's a fairly well wealthy and well-connected family with, you know, expectations for what a young woman should do. Um, Florence Nightingale has no interest in that. She really has these big dreams in, in the field of health and the field of public health. And I like to imagine that Elizabeth Blackwell is really a catalyst for a Florence Nightingale's career because mm -hmm. here's, here's this woman who has left any thoughts of marriage and motherhood behind. She's left her family behind. She's gotten a medical degree and she's wandering all over Europe getting medical experience. She is proof that Florence Nightingale doesn't have to settle down and get married. It, it, there, it, she's proof that this is possible. Um, and so they have this initial like rapturous communion yeah. where they're kind of recognizing themselves in each other and talking about hygiene and, and ideas and fomenting all this energy. And then they, they quickly hit up against the problem, which is that Florence Nightingale really believes that the role of women in health is as nurses. Um, and Elizabeth has predicated her life on proving that it, women can be doctors and they never quite align on this. Um, and then down the road, I think what also complicates their relationship is that Florence Nightingale becomes a global celebrity. Yeah. Um, and Elizabeth Blackwell never quite figures out how to do that. And it irks her a bit. Because she wanted fame. I mean, for this industrious head down woman, one of the things that was interesting is in, in furtherance of her objective, she really did want fame. I mean, she didn't personality-wise do much to endear herself and become the celebrity the way Florence Nightingale did. 
but she did want it. I, it made me wonder about her resenting Florence Nightingale's celebrity. Right. I mean, she, Elizabeth Blackwell wanted recognition. That was the point. The point was to be a beacon, to shine her light so that every w- woman could look up and say, ah, that's what I can aspire to. You, you can't be a beacon if nobody knows your name. Um, everyone knew Florence Nightingale's name because it. Florence Nightingale, even though she was you know, did this extra- these extraordinary things, she kind of stayed in her lane. She talked about nursing and nurses, mm. and that was okay for a woman to talk about. The idea of a woman talking about being a doctor was still outrageous. It was something that polite people didn't talk about. So Elizabeth Blackwell always hit up against this problem that polite society kind of drew its skirts back from her, whereas they embraced Florence Nightingale. Mm. So one of the, um, one of the starkest um, examples that you had in the book of just what Elizabeth Blackwell had to put up with was she's in London and her dream was really Paris. Paris was ahead of other places for educating doctors, but, and she found herself pretty enraptured by London, but nonetheless takes herself off to Paris, uh, where she Describe the place that she ends up in and the circumstances of her her living conditions and the patients there, and then ultimately the damage right. uh, done to her. Because the vividness, Janice, of your describing that time in Paris is worth the admission of the book alone. It's one of my favorite chapters, I have to say. Oh, is that right? <laughs> So Paris is a major center of medical education at this moment. Um, It it is a major center of progressive medical education. Um, It is moving forward at a higher rate. And a lot of the medical education in Paris is free. It's state sponsored. And Elizabeth is drawn there like a moth to the flame and then discovers that almost all of the education in Paris that's free is only free if you're male. Um, Because if you're a woman, you're not allowed in. And she refuses to pretend to be a man. She says, I'm not going to go in disguise. The point is to prove that a woman can do this. I'm not going to pretend to be a man. So she goes and she ends up in the only hospital that will really welcome her. Uh, It's called La Maternité. And it's a a municipal obstetric hospital, a a teaching hospital, which takes young women from all over France um, to train to be midwives. So two young women from each department in France would come and board, live there, uh, train to be midwives and then go back to their to their um, home areas. So Elizabeth, even though she has a medical degree, uh, decides to enroll there as a student because of the volume of obstetric cases she will be able to watch there. She will really be able to get some experience, but it's a municipal hospital, it's 1849. And if you are delivering a baby in a hospital in 1849, you are destitute because if you have any money at all, you are delivering at home. Um, the women who labor and deliver at La Maternité are often prostitutes. A lot of them are infected with venereal diseases. Um, they provide her with sort of a crash course about ideas about public health and the connections between poverty and disease. But they also become this the, 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 the source of this crisis in her young career, which is if you are... Uh, a baby born to a woman with gonorrhea and you pass through the birth canal, you can become infected uh, with something called gonococcal conjunctivitis. It's an eye infection. Um, Today, it would be easily treatable with antibiotics. In 1849, those hadn't happened yet. Um, And Elizabeth was treating one of these infants when some of the liquid she was using to bathe its eyes splashed into her face. And she contracted gonococcal conjunctivitis, which was a catastrophe. the fate of her vision hung in the balance for weeks. She was confined to a bed in the hospital where she had been working um, and, you know, and, and was in crisis for a while. She ended up losing one eye, um, being fitted for a glass prosthetic that she wore for the rest of her life, although not a whole lot of people knew that about her. Um, and it, 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 it took surgery out of the picture. She could no longer do that. And it forced her more and more in the direction where she was already heading, truth be told, toward public health and away from actual practice. And, and, you know, the other thing is, she was traveling by herself. She got escorted to Paris by Charles Plevin. That's right. So do you think they, do you think, this is just sort of a 
an aside, but do you think Charles Plevin had hoped to marry Elizabeth and she would just have none of it or wouldn't even think about it? Well, so Charles Plevins was a, a friend of her cousins in England, and when and when she had first gotten to Europe, he had kind of squired her about and shown her a good time, and and she was very grateful. Um, Elizabeth struggled with human connection. Um, she didn't really know how to do intimate friendship, mm. and she was there on a mission, right? And and she really didn't believe that those two things were compatible: her mission and an intimate relationship. Um, so I think. Uh, she probably enjoyed Charles Plevins's company and then decided, no, I can't. I've already told the world that I'm doing this thing. I've already gotten my medical degree. You're in my way. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. You know what? Actually, yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> and, and there's a letter that she writes where she sort of alludes to how he um, didn't take it well. Um, but, you know, I think her idea of herself as was, was, was grand. I won't say grandiose because she fulfilled her. Yeah, because she did it. Um, but it, it didn't include something as mundane as a husband. <laughs> so speaking of letter, uh, I was fascinated by how much material you had of letters that were, you know, I, I don't know how many letters, I'll be curious, but like letters that went from one sibling to the other that were so... How did you access that information? How many letters right. did you end up looking at? Right. So there are nine Blackwell siblings. They were very much a tribe, a clan. They, they really looked to each other more than anyone else in the world. And they all also sort of drove each other crazy. So they were rarely all in the same place at the same time, which meant that they were constantly writing to each other about each other, um, which is an amazing gift to a biographer. Um, yeah. Although it did sometimes feel like I was drowning <laughs> in material. There's uh, more than 100,000 documents at the Schlesinger Library at Cambridge, at Radcliffe. Wow. Um, there's another several tens of thousands at the Library of Congress. Um, those were just the first two places to look. There are smaller um, deposits in many other places. Um, yeah, it was daunting. I, it's, part, it's partly why I wanted to focus the story on um, Elizabeth and Emily, uh, and and their the and the entwined part of their lives. I, I I end the story around 1870 when they part ways, partly because there I just I would have needed volume two to go through <laughs> all of the material all the way through their very long lives. Um, needed needed a little bit of focus there, but it, it was a bit daunting. <laughs> and how did she convince Emily to do what she wanted? I mean, Elizabeth wanted her to do this. She wanted her company, her collegiality. So how did she convince Emily? And then did Elizabeth Standing help Emily get into medical college? Had the pay had the road now been, you know, paved, and e Emily went skipping to medical school? Hardly. So, you know, Emily was Elizabeth's next youngest sister and, and easily the, the most brilliant of the rest of the Blackwell sisters. Um, Elizabeth, you know, wanted company, as you say, and she, you know, I think Emily was used to having three elder, rather bossy sisters. So when Elizabeth said, Emily, I command you to, I, you know, I, I, I claim you to work with me. Um, Emily said, okay. She was actually more drawn to natural science than Elizabeth ever was. Um, <laughs> and 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 off she went. Um, but no, it was not any easier for her to get there uh, than Elizabeth. In fact, it was harder. The 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 men's medical colleges, having recognized that a woman had breached their gates and succeeded, all barred their gates even more strongly against women. Wow. Even Geneva College said, uh, "No, we really don't need another Blackwell sister. Thanks very much." Um, and meanwhile, in the time we between one. <laughs> That's right. Um, one. <laughs> that was plenty. Um, in the time between Elizabeth's graduation and Emily's attempt to get into medical school, um, a couple of female medical colleges had opened, one in Boston and one in Philadelphia. As long as those institutions existed, men's medical colleges could easily reject women because they could say, why do you need to come here? There are those places for you. Go there. Um, Emily, though, I think had <laughs> a healthy sort of competitive spirit as a Blackwell. She didn't want a degree that was any less valid or valuable than the one her sister had earned. So she just hung in there. And first she went to Rush in Chicago uh, where she did her first year. 
uh, very successfully with a wonderful mentor who valued her talent, who then went on sabbatical, whereupon the trustees of Rush said, actually, could you not come back? Um, we're really not comfortable with you. I was devastated with I mean, I can't imagine what that was like. So she manages to get herself in. She performs brilliantly while there. And then she's on her break and they decide not to let her back. I, I'm just furious. They actually wait till she shows up and then they tell her not, not, not oh, right. to, tell her to go away. Um, and she, she had, there's this extraordinary like 10 day period where she just pivots and goes to Cleveland Medical College, yeah. um, far, not too far away. Um, and, uh, you know, says, I'm here, take me, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing this. And they said, okay, um, that, that's, that's the modern case Western from where she got her diploma finally in 1854. So Emily and Elizabeth, Elizabeth comes back from Europe. Uh, Emily had gone briefly to Edinburgh, right? And then they're back in New York and uh, Elizabeth is not finding this medical degree in her dreams working out. And they are, um, really mentored by the doctor from Rush, right? To consider opening what became uh, the New York Hospital, which Emily and Elizabeth opened. So talk to us about how they decided to do it, what that looked like. And again, hospitals were not places you really went to get well. And I mean, that sounds a little ridiculous, but the, the hygiene, the way you, you like go to the hospital and get sicker. Right. But here they are opening this hospital. Tell us how that came about. Right. So Elizabeth gets back to New York first while Emily is still, um, you know, in, in, in her training. Um, and quickly discovers that even though she assumed that women would flock to a female physician because they would want a, a woman to confide their intimate ailments to, uh, actually that wasn't the case because female physician, that phrase did not mean nice young woman with a medical degree, it meant abortionist. That's mm. what the phrase meant. And it meant someone who was you know, working on the wrong side of the law. If you were consulting one, there was something very wrong going on. If you were a nice middle-class woman, you didn't consult a female physician. Um, and wasn't there a woman, wasn't there a doctor or something in New York who actually did provide medicines that would terminate a pregnancy right. and in fact abortion if or aversion? If you looked in the New York directory right around when Elizabeth got to New York, the only other female physician in the New York direct, the city directory was Madame Restel, the notorious Fifth Avenue abortionist. Um, who was, you know, in the news all the time for all the wrong reasons. Uh, Elizabeth could not afford to be associated with her. Mm. Uh, it was really a, a problem. Um, so while she was in New York and Emily was studying at Rush, um, the advice that Emily's mentor was sending was um, start an institution don't look for individual private patients. Um, see if you can channel the largesse of well-meaning wealthy people toward the poor and there, thereby getting some practice for yourself um, with patients who aren't so picky about who is providing it. Um, so while Emily was still away, Elizabeth opened a, a little dispensary, just a, a room. Um, once Emily came back, they opened the New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and Children, um, which had a couple of different purposes. One, a place to provide poor women with female physicians, um, but also a place for the slowly growing numbers of, med of female medical graduates to have a place to get their practical training without having to go to Europe. Um, that was part of their, of their project. You know, in reading um, Elizabeth's language when the um, hospital or infirmary opened, you know, it's sort of startling to realize that what she wanted then, we don't even necessarily have now. So I'm gonna read it because I was so struck by its unprecedented purpose she read on was threefold. To allow women to consult doctors of their own sex free of charge to provide the growing number of female medical students with the practical experience denied them by established hospitals and to train nurses. 
Her tone was level and businesslike, betraying no sense that for most of New York's burgers, not to mention their wives, the idea of a woman doctor was outrageous. She did not mention the loneliness, drudgery, and pain she had transcended to become the first woman in America to receive a medical degree. So if you think about that goal then, you know, we haven't quite met that even now. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and, and you know, to, to go back to your earlier, the, the second part of your earlier question, you know, as you say, hospital, you didn't want to end up in the hospital in the right. 1850s. A hospital is where you ended up where you, if, if, if you didn't have the money to call the doctor to come to your house. Um, and, uh, you know, they were pretty much, I mean, and I think it's David Oshinsky's phrase from that wonderful book, Bellevue, um, they were warehouses for the destitute, right? Mm -hmm. Elizabeth and Emily imagined their hospital as a as a place that was going to be more progressive in terms of ideas like hygiene, um, that 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 prevention and and cold water and fresh air were important parts of healing, which um, was shocking, right? Wasn't but, that considered right. sort of quackery? Right. Well, you know, and this is part of why they wanted to found an institution of their own because this was heresy in in some in some in most minds, and you were never going to be able to do it in the service of some establishment medical type. He was always going to tell you to stop. But if you had your own institution and you were making your own rules and following them, you could, what Elizabeth liked to say, it was, it was about committing heresy with intelligence. So incorporating the things that intuitively they understood were important, um, but that the, the medical establishment hadn't really caught up with yet. There's, there's some moments, you know, just after they found the infirmary and the, you know, the, 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 the men of the neighborhood of the tenement neighborhoods with they, that they were serving would sort of storm the gates once in a while and complain that, you know, the, the lady doctors were killing people with fresh air and cold water. Um, you know, they had to kind of, you know, bring their, their, their clientele along with their, you know, at that point, fairly radical ideas. So they do end up opening adjacent to the, um, infirmary, a medical college for women that existed for into the into the 70s or 80s? The infirmary persisted for that long. The women's medical college was a slightly interesting story. So oh, that's right. Um, um, the women's, they, they never wanted to found a women's medical college because they thought women and men should study medicine side by side. They, they never meant that the sexes should be segregated in medical education, but there were these female medical colleges that existed. They were mediocre. And as long as they existed, the women had no other place to go and no other choice but to get a mediocre medical education. So they changed, the Blackwell sisters changed their minds and they said, okay, clearly we thought that the men would now open themselves to women studying because of our example, that didn't happen. So we're gonna open a women's medical college that is more rigorous and more progressive than what exists for men right now. And we are going to open that for the time being until the men come around. And that's what they did. They opened it in 1869. And in 1899, when Johns Hopkins and Cornell began to admit women to their medical classes, Emily, who was in charge of these institutions by then, shut the college down. She said, it's done. We've, we've, we've held the door open. Now women can go and study alongside, alongside men. This college has no reason for being anymore. And she closed it, but the infirmary persisted well into the 20th century. And then became acquired. Uh, didn't it get incorporated into a hospital that we, what right. hospital did they? Hospitals are sort of like publishing houses. They're all always absorbing each other. <laughs> um, so it was uh, first became part of um, NYU downtown. And now it's part of uh, lower Manhattan hospital, which is, part of the Weill Cornell New York Presbyterian mm -hmm. universe. So Janice, very, um, you know, not that long after Elizabeth goes back to Europe and really, as you say, her goal was never to heal, um, so to speak. But Emily was very suited to that. And Elizabeth's off and Emily is running both the college and the infirmary. Not that Elizabeth Blackwell's name was as well known as we might think, of, of, of course, until you wrote your book, but Emily's name is definitely not known. And yet she was the one sort of in the trenches 
why do you think her name never got traction? Could, right. I mean, she wasn't the first, she was the third. Well, that's it. That's all there is to it. Well, being first is a powerful, powerful thing. Yeah. But I also think, so, you know, Emily and Elizabeth didn't really agree on, on what the role of a woman as a doctor was. Elizabeth, partly because of her injury, but partly because of her own inclinations, thought that a woman doctor was fundamentally a teacher armed with science. And in 1870, she, with some relief, um, went back to England for the, for the last four decades of her life and settled there and did public policy and, and moral reform and prevention, did a lot of writing and lecturing, leaving Emily to run the institutions that they had founded. And Emily really believed that a woman doctor should be just an excellent surgeon and practitioner like a male doctor. That was the, that was the point for her. And she ran those institutions with enormous skill. Although her, her sister's name, as the first and the founder was always attached to them. And Emily, I think, sustained her sister's legacy almost to the detriment of her own mm. because she ran these institutions so well and they survived so long and always kept her sister's name in front of the public. Um, they eclipsed, she eclipsed herself in a way. It's, it's interesting. They both died within months of each other in 1910. And there was an enormous celebration of their lives at the New York Academy of Medicine with many eulogies. And it's really interesting to read the eulogies because the ones for Emily are really warm and respectful. This mm. was a woman who had mentored a, a couple of generations of students who had really won the enormous respect of the medical community in New York. And so the encomiums to her are very personal. The ones that people offered for Elizabeth um, spoke of her as if she was an idea more than a person mm -hmm. because she hadn't been around for 40 years. Um, it's an interesting, it's, you can, you can see it happening right there that, 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 that Emily sustained the idea of Elizabeth. Um, and, and that's what has come to us because she was the first. Uh, and, and, you know, Janice, the, the idea that the eulogies were warm for Emily and more of an idea, uh, with Elizabeth also plays out in the personal lives that they each ended up living, which was quite different, though they both adopted kids, but share with us what their, the rest of their lives, basically four decades were like in terms of their personal lives. Right. So Elizabeth back in the 1850s had adopted a, a, a sort of a six or seven year old Irish orphan. She was very, Elizabeth was lonely. She needed a companion and she brought this child home with the explicit purpose of sort of daughter slash servant slash companion. And this little girl, Kitty, grew up to be just that. She was Elizabeth's companion. She ironically never invited to consider marriage or a career of her own, either one of those. She was there to be Elizabeth's companion. And that is the role she filled very beautifully and poignantly. Um, for the rest of her life. For the rest of her life, yes. Um, and they went off to England. Kitty went with Elizabeth and, and that's where they stayed as companions. Um, Emily, once Elizabeth was gone, it was, it's interesting to watch. She sort of, and this is sort of outside the main um, focus of the book, but I'm fascinated by it. As soon as Elizabeth is gone, she kind of creates a home life for herself um, out of nothing. She, yeah. she she finds a, a female partner, she, a, a woman who had been a student at the medical college, who was an excellent surgeon, um, very deeply respected by Emily. Um, she becomes her domestic partner. Uh, and she and Emily adopts a baby um, who she treats much more conventionally as a daughter. This is a, a and child. calls her mother, right? Calls her. Right. Kitty never called Elizabeth anything other than Dr. Elizabeth. Hmm. Uh, There's a warm relationship. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, uh, Emily's relationships look much more like conventional familial yeah. um you know, steeped in contentment and love, um, those kinds of relationships. And and um, do I, am I remembering this right? That it was actually Emily's um, domestic partnership that got you started in even thinking about the book. Is that do I have that correct? In a way. So I was casting about for um, a new project after my first book, um, and I I am always interested in the stories of border crossing 19th century women who 
um, because they focused, because they turned their backs on marriage to focus on career, um, then found emotional fulfillment in unconventional ways. Um, so I was leafing through a book on, you know, um, major lesbian contributions to 19th century history. And Emily was in the book. And I thought, huh, that's interesting. You can't, you can't investigate Emily for more than 11 seconds without getting to Elizabeth. I had never heard of either of them. Yeah. Uh, so once I realized that there was a, a, a bigger story, uh, you know, but yeah, I, I think I had a very unconventional, unconventional introduction to the Blackwells because nobody ever comes to them via Emily. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that surprised me just as an aside, I know in um, some of the uh, talks that you've given, you have a set of slides and there were, there was a kid's book. Oh, there were many, yeah. And with with the first doctor story, yeah. um, you know, I I couldn't believe, given my own background as someone as a kid who grew up in New York, where they practiced, went to a proudly feminist all girls school from the age of five. I yeah. was the math and science kid graduating with the intention of pursuing medicine. How did I not hear of these women? How did I not yeah. hear them? Um, so I you know, kind of went looking, and I realized that there are many versions of the Blackwell story on the children's shelf. But you know, it does also, doesn't it also make you think about, um, you know how like the New York Times now has obituaries of uh, women or people of color that really invented this, that, or the other thing, but somebody else took credit or, you know, so you, you are reminded when you read, when I read your book and you think about the remarkableness and the, ch the, 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 the challenges that they overcame and their intrepidness and that someone like you wouldn't know about them, it just reinforces the degree to which we've kind of buried these people that didn't fit the kind of classic mold for any number of things. That's right, that's right. And, and I think there's an, an additional level of this too, which is that the reason that the Blackwells are all over the children's shelves is that children's stories are incomplete. They're sanitized, mm. they're packaged. Um, the Blackwells, when you get to know them, are not Disney princesses. Yeah, they're, they're a little messy. In distress. They're, they, they are not, they are not um, feminist icons. They are often not in alignment with the women's movement. They're often saying things that come across as deeply misogynist, mm -hmm. they're complicated, um, and they don't fit into that 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 fairy that the, the sort of um, you know the fable the feminist fable um, and I think that's why they get overlooked because I think you know people pick them up and think oh I should tell this story and then they think oh you. I don't really like her <laughs> right I mean I, I I encountered that along along the way that sort of like I don't really like these women Janice and and I, I kept saying that's the point that's the point we have to learn how to admire not just women, but heroes in all in all shapes and sizes who aren't always admirable. How do you admire someone who isn't always admirable? You have well, to Well, you know, one of my favorite quotes is from not a well-known person, but from the 18th century, he was a humorist. And he said that as Americans, we love um live conformists and dead nonconformists. <laughs> you know, we really don't like people challenge, we like people who challenge the status quo in theory or from a distance, but we don't really want to deal with their kind of being the one raising their hand at the back of the room and not shutting up about the, say, you know, we want them to go away. We just want the changes that they want mm -hmm. and their commitment to them to take hold in some smooth other way. Mm -hmm. And that's what I thought of when I thought that we didn't know these women and they weren't cute and female and flirty and charming and uh, or ingratiating. Right. Well, that's that 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 is the the, the crux of it right there. The likability factor. I mean, my yeah. goodness, we've just lived through four years of of difficulty <laughs> because somebody wasn't likable enough for us. Yeah. Uh, that's 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 very clear. And, you know, I, I, when I do my, um, when I, when I talk with slides, I always, the last slide I always put up and, and if you, you can, you can try this at home. If you Google Elizabeth Blackwell and you go to images, you will always find a really attractive sepia photo of a young woman with a curly fringe and a choker kind of gazing off into the distance. She looks like she's looking at her future. 
and it and it, and and it's always identified as Elizabeth Blackwell. It it, it is even it's not on the cover of at least one biography, and it's not her. It's probably one mm -hmm. of her nieces. Um, it's very clear that it's not her. I've I've actually hunted down the photo and flipped it over and noticed that it was photographed in a studio that didn't exist until Elizabeth Blackwell was sixty five and not twenty like the woman in the picture. Um, but it's way it's the way we want Elizabeth Blackwell. Yeah. To we want her we to. We want them both ways. We want it all. Right. Right. We want the trailblazer who's adorable and charming. You have to let go of that when it comes to women, especially. So, so Janice, I have two questions uh, in closing. One is, um, do you think Emily and Elizabeth ended their lives uh, feeling happy? <laughs> Uh, well, different people have different definitions of happiness. Uh, I think Elizabeth, I think, um, could look back and feel some satisfaction that she did what she said she was going to do, mm -hmm. and that's very important to her. Um, I think she uh, did not find the kind of fulfillment in England that she had hoped to. I think she thought that she might, you know, kind of rise to, alongside Florence Nightingale and become an icon. Um, in her own right once she got there, and she didn't. And that, I think, was difficult. Um, I think Emily did find a, a, an, an enormous degree of contentment, both um, personally and professionally. She, um, she, she also did what she said she was going to do, um, and then she kept doing it. Um, I think uh, she, she, you know, she was a surgeon and a practitioner and a medical professor and a mother and a partner and you know her and and her her adopted daughter grew up to give her four grandchildren. Um, you know, I, I think she had a lot more sources of satisfaction than mm. Elizabeth ended up having. Although I don't think Elizabeth would ever have admitted that. Yeah, and and I would have I I had the same impression and in that kind of annoying way as a working mother, which I know you are, is Emily did manage to balance both, right? She did end up with a very prestigious, accomplished uh, medical career and had, from what I understand from your book, a successful home life. Right. I, I think uh, her definition of motherhood was not quite as capacious. Yeah as the modern definition of motherhood. Um, she adopted this child and, and she did not spend an enormous number of hours in the day looking after her. She had a, didn't she have a sibling in the house who was? Had her youngest sister, Ellen, yeah. who was a painter, but not a particularly successful one. And she ended up being kind of handy to have around to look after whatever we did. Don't you love that, handy to have around? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and she also had, you know, servants. Um, th this was not uh, a, a, a work she life. She wasn't on the floor playing uh, games. No, with no clock <laughs> towers. No, 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 no none of that. <laughs> uh, and didn't didn't some of her grandchildren or great grandchildren become doctors also? Not hers. So um, of you know, among oh, her nieces or nephews. Yeah, there were, there were uh, some of. So Sam Blackwell, who was Elizabeth and Emily's oldest brother, um, had five daughters, two of whom went on to study at the Women's Medical College that the Blackwells had founded and become doctors. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, to close, I want to, and you you kind of inferred the answer here, but I want to go back and just in a pointed way address it. So. Elizabeth Blackwell's goal was proving a truth that women could be anything they wished according to the limits of their individual talent. So I'm curious if she would have felt that medicine, you know, she just sort of picked medicine to accomplish that. And do you think that at the end of her life, if in, you know, in a moment of, self-reflection outside the glare of her public persona. Do you think she felt like she got that done? I think so. I. It's funny when, when people say, so if you had coffee with Elizabeth, what would you ask her? That's what I would ask her. Um, that I, I would say, did you make the right choice? Was medicine the right way to prove yes. the point about what women could do? Um, I think 
although it, it wasn't something that she had a vocation for, I think she she rose to the intellectual challenge of it and came to recognize that there was a lot of, um, a, there was almost as much beauty in science as there was in history and philosophy, which were her first loves. Um, and I think she really was challenged and stimulated by some of the public health and moral reform initiatives that she um, was working on in the last decades of her life. She though, she was an idealist in a way that you don't see too often anymore. She operated on yeah. a plane of idealism that was just way above and beyond what most mortals aspire to. Um, and I don't, and in that way, I don't think she was ever going to be satisfied. I think yeah. that part of what drove her. That's it's inconsistent that's with that. being that way, isn't it? Don't you think when you're that driven and that idealistic, it seems like it's almost impossible for you to feel like you tied it all up with a ribbon and did exactly what, because that's who you are. You're that driven to that's accomplish right. something literally glorious. That's right. And I think that was both her triumph and her tragedy because yeah. I think it also, it walled her off from some of the satisfaction that say Emily had by running the things that they had started so wonderfully. Um, there's, a, there's a great quote, um, Mary Putnam Jacoby, another major figure in early women's medicine, uh, was, was a colleague at the Women's Medical College. And there's a letter later that she writes to Elizabeth who, who, who inspired her early on to become a doctor, where she says, you know, you, you had the idea, you got this started, mm -hmm. And then you left us to do the actual work. <laughs> yeah. Part. And that, that's very poignant. Yeah, it really is. Uh, so, uh, Janice, what I, I, I'd like to thank you on, on any number of levels. One is um, I am just thrilled uh, that I got to read the book. I mean, it's just, it, it, it's a book to remind all of us what can be. It's a book that reminds us of history and challenges. And you're just a great storyteller. You're a wonderful uh, storyteller. And then thank you for joining us um, for this conversation. And I'd like to leave you with the last words, if you wouldn't mind reading the first two paragraphs in the book, because I think they sum, sum it up so perfectly. So. Um, I'll leave it to you. Okay, here we go. On May 14th, 2018, a cheerful crowd of activist New Yorkers blocked the sidewalk at the corner of Bleecker and Crosby Streets. Before them stood an elderly and unremarkable building, four stories topped by a pair of attic dormers, battered brick facade obscured by a fire escape, pre-hipster neighborhood bar on the ground floor, after a parade of speakers, all but one of them women, the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation unveiled a commemorative plaque, the newest stop on its civil rights and social justice map. In this building, it read, the first female doctor in America, Elizabeth Blackwell, established the first hospital for, staffed, and run by women. Applause erupted, VIPs grinned, cameras clicked. There was a triumphant sense of reclaiming a hero of restoring a story of female agency, of lifting for just a moment the grim political mood. Someone was selling eye-popping t-shirts, black and hot pink on white, Elizabeth Blackwell, OGMD. The celebrants dispersed into the balmy evening, imagining the first female doctor, saintly and sepia-toned, bending solicitously over her grateful patients, or maybe a fiercer version, original gangster of medical women, crusading feminist. Both images were satisfying. Neither was accurate. Thank you so much, uh, Janice, for that. And as a postscript, uh, just to share with everybody here, so the necklace you're wearing, what does that have to do with the building? So the building, as, it, as that prologue says, still stands in, in Greenwich Village, and it is now the property of a wonderful, extraordinary jewelry designer named Jill Platner, who um, discovered and was inspired by the Blackwell story almost a decade before I ever heard of it. Um, and she designed one of her jewelry collections. Um, this, this, this is a pendant from her Blackwell collection, and it was made in the building. 
um, which kind of, she, when she's restoring the building from the studs out and um, I got to write the chapter about the infirmary in the building, um, which was just thrilling at a very deep level to, to look around and see the brickwork and the rafters and the windows the way they would have seen it when they founded the hospital. Yeah. So thank you so much, Janice. And thanks to all of you for uh, joining us. I cannot encourage you enough to buy this book. You need to buy this book. So click, click on the side there, I think where Erica said that we can um, do that. You will, you will be uh, quite rewarded uh, for that. So thanks and everybody have a good evening. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure.